welcome everybody. This is the U.S. Grace Wars podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with my very good friend, the amazing Father Richard Heilman. And we've also got with us the amazing Dr. Daniel O'Connor is with us tonight. And he's wearing a hat. We're doing a hat doctor. thing. Okay. Wannabe doctor, yeah. It's a hat thing. Okay. He's that close. He's that close. That close. All right. He's close enough for us. All right. <laughs> Great title tonight. Everybody's going to be wondering what in the world Harrison Butker and the Vatican's new document on apparitions have to do with each other. But right. we have found a connection here. <laughs> and we're going to break this down. And I really believe people are going to understand and appreciate. I really do. I think they're going to appreciate what we're doing here. We're, we've got to pose some questions. we got to challenge some thought process out there, all for the sake of trying to reach the greater good. Of course, everything starts with the greater good of prayer. So, Father, we always let you take care of that. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much, Father. And thank all of you out there who support the U.S. Grace Force podcast. We always, always remember you at the beginning of these episodes because we can't do it without you. Your prayers, your encouragements. And it's always great, again, traveling around different places in the country and someone comes up and says, hey, we watched the podcast and it really is helping us in one way or the other. So, you know, we find it in various places, even in the office of the United States Social Security Department. <laughs> That's right. Which actually did happen. So without going into too much detail on that, even there, someone recognized, you know, an, an aspect of the podcast and said that it helped. So thanks be to God for that. And all of you who support us with your prayers, your encouragements, and your financial support through the Patreon program. It is a huge assistance to help us continue to get this message out. If you're interested in supporting us financially, you can throw a few dollars every month our way. That's a tremendous help. Click the link in the description below, the Patreon link, and that will get you started. And we thank you so much for that. But all of you who help us support us, pray for us, encourage us, uh, support us financially, you are all in our prayers every day. So thank you so much for that. Also, don't forget to go out to the U.S. Grace Force gear page, link in the description. Get yourself some cool gear, t-shirts, hats, uh, hoodies, all kinds of fun stuff out there. Gets the message out. And again, help support the work that we do. And tonight, again, we've got, is it really almost Dr. Daniel? Because I was under the assumption you were a professor of some sort. I am a adjunct, but I'm at the bottom of the totem pole of higher education. I'm an adjunct professor at a community college, and I love being at the bottom of the totem pole. So I got okay. kicked out of my PhD program because I wouldn't take the, the you-know-what so before I could oh, wow. actually get my PhD. So I'm not doctor. I'm just lowly adjunct professor okay well all right you're, i, I you're, don't necessarily want to answer close. the lowly adjunct perfect professor <laughs> yeah like father says you're that close and that's close it's, enough for us yeah <laughs> anyway daniel thanks for being with us tonight man great to be here yeah. thanks for having me back yeah and i wanted to uh we we talked before we started recording and and uh we wanted to start dan i want to get your opinion on this and i you know i i don't know i can't tell exactly what god is doing but I don't know. I think he does use signs in the sky and things like that. And um, I just found it interesting. So what I told these guys beforehand, I want to tell all the listeners right now. Uh, here, here's the way I was thinking. Is that uh, we started out with this uh, amazing solar eclipse, right? And if everybody remembers or if you're tuned in at that time, this was the 2024 eclipse. Well, there was another one that passed uh, diagonally in the other direction, in 2017 okay so but interesting that people were find, discovering that the 2017 one passed through seven cities of salem and then this 2024 one passed through first of all city of jonah and then the seven cities of nineveh i, I think from what i read are the only seven cities of nineveh in the united states okay so very interesting uh salem actually translates to shalom or peace but um, but Nineveh is, and, and Jonah is the story of, obviously, the story of Jonah, where he was sent by God to warn the Ninevites that 40 days more, and they repented, right? And God relented in his punishment. And uh, that's a long story short, obviously. But but uh, but so, so then one might say, well, what's going on here? You know, peace, uh, repentance. Uh, okay. But then you, you look, too, that that 
uh, particular solar event, uh, the, the eclipse happened on April 8th. Well, that year, if everybody remembers, the Feast of the Annunciation, when that the, or literally our Lord comes into the world in the womb of our Blessed Mother, um, was moved off of its usual date of March 25th because it landed during Holy Week and moved to April 8th. Interesting, you know, and I, I just, uh, I just, I just have a brain like that. I, I always wanted to see, God, are you trying to show us something? Uh, what, what, what can we possibly take from all this, or if anything, I don't know. So then you count forty days from April eighth, and you end up on May eighteenth, which is the Vigil of Pentecost. Now I hope everybody's following me right now. Remember forty days with Jonah, so forty days May eighteenth. Well, we just had that last week, didn't we? But d during the, that, those last. Uh, days of uh, before Pentecost, there's the ancient Pentecost novena. It's the original novena. It's where the novena came from. Nine days. Well, what do, what do we know what was going on in the original novena? You had the apostles who were cowering up in the upper, upper room, hiding, basically. And our Lord comes, and on Pentecost, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now these cowards get ignited by the power of the Holy Spirit, and they go out. And they bring the the, the message of the, the Word of God to every corner of the world, right? Um, and, and even miracles occur, supernatural miracles occur. Uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit is made uh, evident to the world. And they ended up martyred. The world hated them for it, right? But the, the church grew by leaps and bounds in the early Christianity right there because of their uh, Holy Spirit um, uh, you know, powered uh, courage to go out and bring this, this the truth to the world. Okay, I hope you're still following me right now. Now, here's what I find interesting. <laughs> I find all that interesting, but, but look at this. Wait a minute. There were seven cities of Salem the first one went through. There were seven cities of Nineveh, the second uh, solar eclipse went through, and they were seven years apart. Now, what goes on in during that novena, that Pentecost novena? On day one, somebody, an unlikely candidate, remember? Jesus picked a fisherman to be our first pope. An unlikely candidate stands up at a Catholic college Benedictine College, and he he gives a speech that, frankly, a lot of our spiritual leaders have been afraid to do because of the backlash they might receive from the world. Well, he got the backlash, but he also got support. Now, <laughs> this is happening on day—he gives a speech on day one, and then throughout this Pentecost novena, it, it's— it's throughout the media, and it's like the only thing people want to talk about, whether to get him to be kicked off. He's a kicker for the um, Kansas City Chiefs. He's, I think he's the best kicker in the NFL, but some people dispute that. But uh, And he's a godly man. He's an amazing father. He talked about his amazing wife and mother. Um, it, he talked about so many amazing things. Uh, maybe we can even put the link in our description here of that talk that he gave at Benedictine College on May 10th, day one of the Pentecost Novena. But here's the thing, remember? Seven cities of Salem, seven cities of Nineveh, seven years apart, and this unlikely candidate stands up. You know what his jersey number is? Seven. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just going, wait a minute. You can't, now, you can't make this stuff up. I, some people are going to go, whoa, and other people are going to roll their eyes. I understand that. I understand that. But but God's amazing, I, I think. And and uh, and so, anyway, what were we praying for in that Pentecost novena? We had the Grace Force, and uh, eighty to 100,000 people are, are enlisted in the Grace Force. We were praying for what? A supernatural revival in the land, okay? Now, here's my take. I think that Satan's 100 years has been about getting us to deny the supernatural. We're intelligent now. We're scientific now. We don't believe in the earth was flat any longer, and we don't believe in the supernatural, okay? Now, this guy gets up, and his faith is so deep, and all he wants to talk about is the power of grace, 
and what that means in his life. And he ser- happens, he serves, he actually trains the servers in his parish, if I understand right, uh, at, and he loves the traditional Latin mass because he loves that sense of the transcendent, that sense of the sacred, that sense of the supernatural, because what, and that is what I believe too, a Nova Soda done well, a traditional Latin mass, what it does, it predisposes us to open up and say, yes, give our fiat, right? Yes, to the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we can be filled with that Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. I think, <laughs> a little like a kicker for a football team, are you kidding me? Well, a fisherman, are you kidding me? You know what I'm saying? I mm-hmm. I would love to see this thing blow up into a ph- phenomenon. Anyway, th- that's that, that's my take on it. Dan, um, what do you think about what I just said? Thank you, amen. All right. There's going to be people saying, oh, my goodness, how dare you make so much of some of some kicker right. giving a talk? But just, just look at the facts. I mean, go to go, go to the most left leaning mainstream media's uh, homepage, uh, new uh, online yep. homepage a couple days ago. It was going to be about him, about yep. this speech that uh, yep. that uh, that a football kicker gave at a Catholic college's commencement. Harrison he was hated Butker, by the world, yeah, hated by the world. What did Jesus yep. say in the gospel? If the you know, if the world hates you, know it has hated me first. Right. Well, you can have all your theories about how irrelevant this guy is. Or whatever. But the fact is, he's not. The fact is, he, this speech in which he promoted Orthodox Catholic teaching, right, was given a bigger platform than any, any of all of these ultra expensive, flashy new evangelization stuff we've been doing for many years. Has I know. <laughs> in, a, in a day, one act of courage. Yeah. That's yep. all it took is one uh, act of courage. Day one of the Pentecost Novena. For on on it, the beginning of the this novena, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it was everywhere, blew yeah. up across the world. Yeah, and when have we ever gotten that exposure before? I know. Well, when and, is Orthodox and, and Catholic for me, Catholic? he was a man's man because, right. of course, he was right. at a Catholic college talking about Catholic things, and he's Catholic. I get that, but but he was saying things that people are afraid to say right now because mm. the world has taken charge. That's you know, the, we're down to what. 20% at best that are uh, regular, that are practicing their faith. I mean, back when I always sit point out when I, when I was born, over 75% were practicing the faith. And it was just normal to live like Christians. That just means moral and, and you know, values and virtues. Um, now, those kinds of things are a threat. And you need to be, you know, castigated. You need to be put out like he like they're trying to do with him. Put him out of the NFL. Uh, ruin his life for because he dared talk about the truths of the Catholic faith, and and it, like you said, the platform was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, well, and, and I think, and I think also, I mean, like you're saying, you know, Dan, you made a point. It, it got more attention, and it's drawn more attention, and it's still drawing more attention in some ways than even statements and things that are made by some of our our you know church and spiritual leaders, and and that's not to any way to diss or put down them. But it makes, a, I think, a really interesting point as to where our culture and our society is. I mean, Daniel, your take on how quickly, call it the left, let's just call it the anti-God crowd in general. When I say anti-God, they may believe in God, but they're anti how God has structured things, you know, in general. And then there are those that are just flat out atheists and they don't want to hear anything like this. And it's so offensive. You know, one report that over 220,000 signatures have been raised to try to get him kicked off the football team. Are you kidding me? This is a man who has his own opinion. Let's call it First Amendment, that he has his own opinion to say what he wants at a Catholic college about his Catholic faith, which has been held worldwide for um, a couple thousand years in general, (laughs) speaking here. The, the the dynamics of this on different levels are really interesting to watch. And I mean, I, I just think we're at a point now where, you know, the we need adults to step up here, you know, on the left who are saying, oh, we've got to get rid of him and fire him and, and, and tear him apart because how dare he say something contrary to what we believe, even though he's speaking about his faith in such ways. I want to see spiritual leaders be much more on board. I know Bishop Strickland, I think, um, several others, a few others got on board and have publicly supported him in what he said. But Daniel, any reflection or thought on just the dynamics of how this has unfolded in such a way? And I think Father made some great points about the timing of this, 
He seems, of all people, an athlete. Look, we're fine when athletes support Planned Parenthood, when they support, you know, certain political views that really are anti-family in many respects. And everybody praises them for that. We got a guy that stands up and says, hey, you know, for about 2,000 years or so, this is kind of where we've been with this. And there's facts and statistics to back this up, it's many of these things. What, what do you think, Daniel, about the phenomenon of how this has unfolded in these different levels? The timing is remarkable. And again, if you want to if you want to call us crazy, just pu putting these these weird dots together, we're just following the lead of what has already been reported, even on mainstream media. So just, so just you could look on the main websites of these places and they're reporting on precisely the things we're talking about. You might you probably looked at this at this title of this YouTube video and thought, what what on earth can these possibly have to do with each other? Well, we're explaining. We've hit, we have, we see here during this Pentecost novena, a man of the world uh, speaking up boldly for uh, the the truth of heaven. Simply put, I mean that's probably the easiest way to put it. And unfortunately, in the same time, we see uh, the the leaders of the church not being as strong in the very same thing. In fact, I was looking at Bishop Strickland's blog, Bishop uh, Joseph Strickland's blog, just a week or two ago, a week or two ago, and he was lamenting, and just seeing if I have it here on my screen, he was lamenting that that, that certain bishops, and here on this podcast, we're not we're not uh, rebelling against any any magistrate of the church or anything. We're just asking questions, and we are. Uh, wondering what's going on with certain individual men in the church. But he lamented that certain bishops will move against an apparition with no investigation whatsoever and with no concern as to whether or not heaven is truly speaking, and they'll just right away condemn it. And that was quite prophetic. That was on Bishop Strickland's own blog on uh, bishopstrickland.com. I think it was um, I think it was just two weeks ago in May of this year. And then what do we see just a couple days ago as of our recording this? We see the Vatican itself coming out with certain guidelines. And this is not an act of papal magisterium that we're talking about here. This, I believe, was promulgated by Cardinal Fernandez. And yes, it has um, Pope Francis' signature on it. But there's a number of, of items in this document that came out a few days ago on apparitions that we are... Uh, we, we have questions about. We're wondering what is what are the implications of this, the ramifications of this. And it seems to be, in an ironic sense, these two things from the Catholic Church, the two things that made the news this week were a layman, just a normal husband and father who happens to kick balls for a football team, coming out in strong support of traditional Catholic truth. And on the other hand, we have a document from the Vatican coming out that seems to uh, at least be possibly used in such a way as to cast doubt on everything that heaven has said. Yeah. And I've got a lot of thoughts about that, but we'll see. Yeah, you know, and, and um, I, I want to say, too, is that uh, we have you on because you're very knowledgeable and this is an area that you've uh, really poured yourself into. And so we want to hear from you on this because um, I'm seeking the truth. I really am. Um, and I know you are, and I know our listener, listeners are. Uh, but seeing, you know, without clarification, without, you know, a, a deeper understanding of these things, on the surface, you kind of go, and that's what happened to me with fiducia supplicans. Um, you know, I was I was telling the story because uh, the Pope, Pope Francis, was interviewed on 60 Minutes uh, this weekend as well. That's another event that happened. Uh, he was uh, interviewed on 60 Minutes. And in the interview, uh, he, he said, and this is referring to uh, Fiducius Supplicans, he said, um, uh, he was asked uh, in the interview whether, you know, he, the, the, there's such thing as blessing of same-sex couples. And here, here was his answer. He said, what I allowed was not to bless the union. That cannot be done. I cannot. The Lord made it that way. To bless each person, yes. The blessing is for everyone. To bless homosexual union, however, goes against the given right, against the law of the church. But to bless each person, why not? Well, here was my comment after I saw that quote and, and actually watched the video on that 
um, I, I said this, I said, I said from the moment of the release of Fiducia Supplicans that I would never bless a couple living in sin. That cannot be done. That would be condoning sin. What would I do? I would take one off to the side and pray over them and ask the other person to wait over there. Then I would pray over the second person the same way. For this, I was accused of bashing the Pope by some. Now, getting back to that quote I just shared from 60 Minutes, I ended with, so I'm so glad it turns out that I was more in line with the Pope than was my accusers. Okay, he says, bless individuals, but not couples. And so, you know, it's, it's my way of saying is that on the surface, you're going, wait a minute, you can't bless couples or even have the perception of condoning that, but maybe you go ahead and bless that individual and then go over and bless that individual. And I, I think that's fine, but it took this time and that 60 minute interview for the Pope to say, oh yeah, go ahead and bless individuals, but you can't bless uh, homosexual unions. So uh, again, I think when we're looking now at this newest document, we have struggled with the same kinds of things. On the surface, are you really saying this? Uh, I Just, you know, help us out to understand because um, on the surface, you know, it, it doesn't look too great. Uh, so Dan, um, What's, you know, I, I know this just broke uh, this past Friday, okay? And again, that was all during the Pentecost Novena too. And again, we were playing for a supernatural revival. And on the surface, Dan, doesn't it seem like this is like saying, I don't know, it feels like to me, and I got to dig more deeper and I need experts like you to help me. But it seems like me, like it's it's almost warning us against the supernatural. I don't know, that might be too severe, but... What's your concerns about this, or what's your questions about um, this document? I, I have I have a number of, of concerns, and questions would probably be a better way of putting it, but I wrote a post on this um, a few days ago, and, and honest, to be honest, since then, my concerns have only grown much deeper, and, and um, what I, when these concerns I share, they're mine. They're, I'm not speaking for a father or before or we go here, on. I, I think that, I don't know if we ever named the document and, and you know what. Basically, the the current document I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but yeah, it's okay. it's actually not an act of papal magisterium. It's a document from Cardinal Fernandez, kind of like fiducia supplicans. So right for, for father to uh, uh, speak to you about that that conundrum there with fiducia supplicans and the blessing of homosexual unions. I, I would wager that that was prophetic. And um, what we have here is something from a cardinal that, yes, it has the Pope's signature under it, but that does not in and of itself render it an act of papal magisterium. Now, I'm, I'm doing my absolute best, and I always have done my absolute best to be an obedient Catholic. I, I am not the Pope. I'm just, I'm just a knucklehead, and I submit to the Pope's magisterium. Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus didn't say anything about some millennia from now. You'll start a, uh, you know, there will be a, a Roman curia and all these different dicasteries and all these different cardinals and bishops and every document that they write, as long as Peter puts a signature on it, that's God's truth. No, Jesus didn't say that. He said, you are Peter. And I think it's quite clear that in the divine constitution of the church, there is a great difference between documents produced by the Roman Curia and actual acts of papal magisterium. And when we're dealing with fiducia supplicans or this new document on apparitions, we're dealing with a document written by a cardinal that, sure, it has the Pope's signature under it, but that does not in and of itself render it an act of papal magisterium. And Father and I, I didn't even know this until we were talking before this video today, but Father and I both had said apparently the basically the exact same thing about fiducia supplicans. I put up a video several months ago, shortly after it came out, begging uh, priests to not bless homosexual couples, but instead to take each aside and say, and, and, and basically I, I was trying to be as pastoral as possible with it. I said, I encouraged priests to say, thank you so much for coming to me. I was praying yes. and hoping that you would come. And that's what yes. we need to be. We need to be a church and we need to be a field hospital for sinners. I agree with yes. Pope Francis in that. Say, let me bless you individually. 
Thank, and, but and, and now let me bless this other person individually. Yes. And that's what Father and I were both saying months and months ago, yep. and we were called schismatics for it. Yep. And here's because we were contradicting the text of Fiducia Sufficans written by Cardinal Fernandez, because that said, bless the couple. And we were saying, no, bless mm -hmm. the individual. And now we have Pope Francis himself, the vicar of Christ, coming out and saying, bless the individual, not not the couple. <laughs> he's, he's, he's really pushing back against what Fiducia Sufficans itself said. Right. So that's important for us to note now, because we're talking today about this document on apparitions, and it's not an act of papal magisterium from Pope Francis, just like Fiducia Supplicant. It's written by Cardinal Fernandez, if I recall correctly. Sure, it has a Pope's signature under it, but that does not mean that it is thereby God's infallible truth. It's from the Roman Curia, but there could be problems in here. And in my opinion, I'm only speaking for myself here, not Father or Doug, I think there are serious problems. And I, uh, the concerns I expressed several days ago have only grown much deeper, actually, in the days in the days since. And when I see um, the, the Vatican suddenly, after all these decades, centuries, actually, saying, oh, no, no, there's no longer such a thing <laughs> as supernatural apparitions. All we're going to do is at most give our Nihil Obstat to it. That's the one category that the new document prevent, uh, presents as an option. The other five categories are all in one way, shape, or form, basically a negative opinion. So the church is now based, the Vatican, I should say, not the church that, that's constituted by Jesus Christ, but certain men in the Vatican are now basically pushing are ladies apparitions to the side and this is in stark contradiction now can I, can I can i quickly please, interrupt please do please do yes well i just want to say it appears that way and so help us out you know if mm -hmm. if, if we're reading this wrongly you know then then help us out because as you're speaking i'm listening to you which is amazing um i'm i'm here literally hearing in my ear <laughs> All the people going, no, you're reading it wrong. Like, like I was accused with fiducia supplicans, you know. Um, so I just want to give that little qualification that, you know, it, it it appears this way. It really does. So go on. Yeah, yeah. And so we're talking about appearances here. I'm, I, I am, I, I'm the most fallible person on the face of the planet. Maybe I'm reading it completely wrong. But when I see, uh, when I see the document. Uh, giving only, you know, the, the the 1978 norms on discerning apparitions. You could still find it in the Vatican's website. It was very clear. It, 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 it jived with common sense. And common sense says there's basically two answers to a question. Yes and no. And yes, there was a third possibility, which is in, in humility. The older norms said, basically, the third option was we don't know, non-constat. And some people have misinterpreted that over the decades, non constat de supernaturalitate, meaning it cannot be said to be supernatural, which is not a condemnation. It's basically the Vatican saying, or the church or bishop saying, we don't know. But still, the two basic responses to any question in accordance with the basic logical axiom, which is the foundation of all philosophy, the law of the excluded middle, either A or not A, either yes or no, either, either it is from heaven or it is not from heaven. We don't have that anymore in this document as, as far as it seems to me. So I don't see what, I don't see in this new document basically any any correspondence with basic logical philosophical truth here. We have six different ways that the bishops are given to respond to an apparition and not one of them consists in the bishop saying, this is from heaven. And that's the that's the crux of the matter here, is that bishops have been told that they can no longer say that heaven is speaking. And you're saying that back in 1978 was when we had it was clear that it was one of three things. Right. This is of supernatural origin from heaven. It is not of supernatural origin, condemned, or we don't know. We can't tell. Right. Evidence isn't clear enough to us. Okay. And now it's six instead of three, and none of them state. This is of supernatural origin. It simply says that the Neil Obstad, if I pronounce that correctly, it basically mm -hmm. means what? That it just doesn't Nothing contradict the doctrine yeah. of faith. And okay. even that, I've got it on my other screen here, even that is hedging its bets. So this is the most positive possible mm -hmm. um, 
so uh, judgment for a bishop allowed by the dicastery to render on an apparition, an ihalab's head, nothing obstructs, nothing stands in the way. Even that one says, without expressing any certainty about the supernatural authenticity, we say that there's signs of God there, and you know, there's no aspects in contradiction, at least so far. So e even the most positive possible hmm. decision for the church to render on an apparition now is nothing other than, well, there's nothing horrendously wrong. So maybe at least for now, the, the, the utter lukewarmness here is what stands out to me the most. We're no longer willing to believe in heaven. And as the catechism says, the Marian, this is right in the catechism, the Marian dimension of the church precedes the Petrine dimension of the church. And that, of course, does not mean they're in conflict, never. But the Marian dimension, it's even its even prior. It's even, it, its supreme even to the Petrine, meaning the whole, all, all the details of the, dog, the dogmas and the doctrines as expressed by the magisterium, that's all indispensable. But above all that is the Marian dimension of the church, because Our Lady is the mother of the church. And it's, and it's funny, we're recording this here on the feast yep. of Our Lady, mother of the church. And we yep. did not plan that. It just came out of the blue. But that's a new feast promoted. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, Father, but this wasn't this feast created by Pope Francis? I don't know that. Uh, I, or I don't I, recall it. I, I, I forgive, think, but so it forgive, sounds right. It sounds forgive right. me if I'm wrong on that, people watching this. But I, I feel yeah. like I recall within the last few years, this feast that we're recording on today was actually created by Pope Francis, Feast of Our Lady, Mother of the Church. And that what's what we're reminded of of that is not at all that we can cast doubt on any doctrines or dogmas. Of course not. Those are those are certain. But that still, above all of this, Our Lady is in charge of everything. And she can intervene whenever she wants in order not to give a new public revelation. Of course not. There will never be a new public revelation. But to draw our attention to and explicate further a certain aspect of the gospel, of private revelation. And that's what Our Lady has been doing more than ever before in history for the last hundred years. There have been something like 10 times more apparitions in the last century than in any previous century. And of course, a number of them are false, but not all of them. <laughs> Many of them are true. So Daniel, one of the concerns I have about this new document, and I know just like we already made very clear with the Fiducia Subicon that sometimes it takes months for some of this stuff to make a little more sense. And when Pope Francis comes out in the interview in 60 Minutes and says what he says, as Father mentioned earlier, all that does is kind of then verify what you both of you had been saying prior to that and many other people about how this should and shouldn't be interpreted and, and, and applied. Okay, that being said, when it comes to this document on whether or not an apparition or a message is supernatural, found to be of supernatural origin or condemned and so forth and such, um, it, it, it may take time, obviously, for this to really kind of shake out a little bit. But in the meantime, the concern I have is basic human nature. And human nature, I've always said, is like water going downhill. It always seeks the path of least resistance. We like the bar to be lowered in most cases for a lot of us because it just kind of means we don't have to work as hard sometimes on some things. Exercise, for example, if someone could give you a pill and aesthetically you'd look great and your heart would be great and your blood flow would be great and everything would be just fine, just a pill. You don't have to change your lifestyle. You don't have to exercise. You don't have to control what you eat. You don't have to worry about that stuff. You don't have to get the right amount of sleep. You can party all night long, whatever you want, and take a little pill and you're good. If we lower the bar, there are a lot of people that want to go that way. Um, if a teacher says, okay, I'm not going to grade anybody's tests. We're just going to say, show up. And, you know, maybe you don't even have to always show up. Okay. I'll still pass you. Okay. You're still going to get a, uh, you're going uh, to give you an A in this class. If a coach says that, okay. And we'd fire our coaches in a heartbeat. If they did this, you don't got to show up for practice. Just say you're on the team. You don't even got to wear the same Jersey as everybody else. Okay. Cause that's asking a lot of you. Just, just show up sometimes, tell people when you're in public, if you feel like it, you know what I'm saying though, Daniel? So when it comes to human nature, when those in authority of anything in our life, teachers, coaches, even the church, 
appears to, and this is my concern, this looks like it might be a lowering of the bar. And that's a, this is a question that I have about this, but I get concerned because when heaven has spoken to us in the past, such as Our Lady of Guadalupe, that was a pretty clear one. You know, I mean, the miracle on, on the Tilma is still in existence. Um, Fatima, you know, the miracle of the sun, 70,000 people saw it for up to 40 miles around, documented, recorded, the, everything dried up in an instant, all this documented. And, and, and the prophecy of the Second World War, which happened, and then jumped to even Akita or Our Lady of Kabiho in Rwanda, the prophecy of the genocide. And these things happened, and they were accompanied by miracles, all sorts of miracles in different respects. And then to cast doubt on that, I mean, that little bit of doubt, that little bit of lowering the bar and human nature combined. Give me your thoughts on that, Daniel. Human nature combined with a little bit of doubt is always a dangerous thing. It can be unless the person is incredibly disciplined. What do you what do you say to that? Yeah, it it reminds me of some of the first words in the Bible, which are from the devil, which were God did God really say? Mm. And and uh, it's this idea that maybe maybe heaven didn't really say what it what it said. And if we if we no longer have a option from the church, which is which has always for the whole history of the church been one of the, the rulings of bishops that bishops can give to super to allegedly supernatural phenomena, namely. It is supernatural. It is from heaven. If that's no longer one of the criteria, one of the um, decisions that the bishops can are even allowed to render, what I'm inclined to ask is, is, are we hearing the same voice that our first parents heard in the garden? Did God really say? And what would have been the case if back with Guadalupe or Fatima or Rue de Bac or any of the pivotal apparitions, we were sitting there as the faithful wondering, okay, I, this has a Nihil stat, I guess, but the church says, as I'm reading here from this document, without expressing any certainty about the supernatural authenticity, we, we acknowledge, and I'm reading here from uh, the document from a couple of days ago from section, uh, the conclusion section 17 there, we at least acknowledge that the action of the Holy Spirit is acknowledged at least so far, so we don't even know with this with this current document if this is even going to endure in the future. It's kind of just this temporary. Okay, we won't argue against it. And again, I'm I'm only we're, as Doug said, we're only asking questions here. Is is this going to uh, kind of just cast a shadow on everything that heaven does? Whereas the faithful are simply sitting there wondering, all right, I have no idea if this is from heaven because the church won't say. My my shepherd is not allowed to say anymore hmm. that heaven is speaking. So now I'm just sit, sitting here wondering what's next. That's my concern. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, Dan, <clears throat> when we're talking about this, and again, in rela even relationship to uh, such an incredibly devout Catholic man as Butker, and he believes in the supernatural power of God. He leans into it. He needs it, uh, and he professes it. Uh, and and all this is happening at the same time. And uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. And and here's here's what I believe is that um, when we talk about the hundred years of Satan, uh, and and he and he he said he can destroy his church, right? Well, you can't. You can't destroy the Catholic Church. Will never be destroyed. But have we been weakened? What? What? And to me, this is my take. And you know, listeners can can buy it or or not. But uh, but I believe what what's happened. And if you're talking about God, okay, you're talking about supernatural power. I mean, again, we're recording here the day after Pentecost, um, where we read in the Bible that these cowards that were hiding in that upper room got a power and they went out and they even they saw miracles but they got courage okay now what did Satan what has Satan's been doing he's been in here's one way I can put it 
he's removed our armor. Uh, In other words, his first move in order to destroy us was to, to destroy our belief in the supernatural power of God. And what does he replace it with? He replaces it with pride. What do we call that nowadays? Woke, right? Like I'm, I, I, I'm woke. I'm, I'm awake. I, I know better than all of you riffraff who don't know what I know. That seems to be been going on for a hundred years over in so many ways, over and over and over again. This intelligentsia that is basically telling the the, the that that holy person in the pew, you just don't know better, okay? And so let's stand instead of kneel. You know, let's let's uh, grab our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. Let's get rid of sacred art, sacred architecture, any sense of the sacred, and when we offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, because that's what the riffraff, who didn't know better did when they believed as well that the earth was flat. I mean, I I just feel like that's what we've been going through for a hundred years. And I'm sorry, maybe that's made me trigger happy, but then we get this document again, you know, uh, just two days before Pentecost that says, yeah, no, the supernatural, you you know, we don't I'm concerned. I'm concerned. So I need help. <laughs> Just like I did with Fiducia's supper guns. I, I, I can't believe what they're saying is, is you're blessing a homosexual couples, okay? Because uh, obviously that would be to anybody uh, condoning what they're doing. I mean, you can say it's not, but the action speaks loudly. So yeah, bless individuals. And now the Pope with the 60 minutes has come out and said, yeah, it's bless individuals. I need I need I need someone to go to 60 minutes sooner than later about this particular document and clarify it for it because it just seems like it's another uh hammer against the whole idea of believing in miracles, believing in the supernatural power of God, believing in the power of grace and what it does to us in our lives. Um so that's my concern. Um uh, Dan, what do you what do you think about it? the hundred years of Satan uh, that that we've been weakened, you know? And 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 here's what I think too has been happening at, but when the hundred years is over, is that this is like the Battle of Lepanto, and the the Turks said, okay, now they're weak, now they're divided, all right, now it's time for us to move in and deal the last blow. And that's why yeah. I think we need a remnant to rise up right now. But what do you think about what I said there, Dan? The words of Joshua come to my mind. Who is on my side? Who? And then, and it's just, who is giving the rallying cry? And the answer to that is heaven. And if you don't have confidence that heaven, a lady, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Queen of the Church, the Queen of Heaven, if you don't have confidence that it's that it's your mother asking this of you, then how are you going to have the strength to do it? And I promise you, I promise you, it is. Our Lady, asking this of you, to pray the rosary every day, to go to confession at least once a month, to do all the things that she's asking of us. But but what I see here is the seed of doubt, as, as we said before, did God really say? The seed of doubt being put in right. the hearts of the people about That's apparitions. That's what it feels like. Yeah. And, you know, I have five kids. I have a wife and five kids and a job and a ton of things to do. It's not easy for me to pray the rosary every day and go to confession at least once a month with the whole family and and I go to mass every day, and 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 I and I, and I these are the greatest blessings in my life. Thank, uh, thanks be to God for them. But it really helps knowing that my mother, the Queen of Heaven, is asking of these things, is asking this as, uh, of the faithful. And when I see the seeds of doubt sowed, I I have questions, and I I, I ask, I wonder what is going on behind the scenes here. And uh, it is Heaven saying this. There is absolutely no doubt. And this is why our shepherds have led us so faithfully for so many centuries. And they've said, yes, this is supernatural. Constat, de supernatural, etate. It is from heaven. And this is why I am so concerned about what's going on now. Suddenly, as of two days ago, it is supernatural. 
is no longer an option. And what I see here in the document in Article 27 is it says these norms entirely replace the previous norms. And I'm concerned that people, that certain individuals in the church are going to take this as an indication that there's now no such thing as an approved apparition. And I, I'm concerned that certain individuals in the church will take this as retroactive, even though that's not the correct understanding. I'm concerned that people will take Article 27 here in the current document to say, okay, because these norms, quote, entirely replace, which by the way, and I did the research before this podcast, even the 1983 Court of Canon Law did not specify that word, it did not say entirely abrogate. And, and that, the, 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 they're very careful with every single word here. When they put the word entirely replace in the current apparition norms, I think that was for a reason. And, and, and at least the people will use that for, for a reason. And what I believe we will see soon is certain individuals in the church, even very powerful ones, casting doubt on every apparition that has ever happened in the whole history of the church. It's precisely the moment when it is most essential that we take those apparitions absolutely seriously, because Our Lady is leading us to the triumph of her Immaculate Heart, which requires well, us that, believing. You, know, you bring up a very interesting point, Daniel, because many of the past apparitions are related to good success, which we just addressed in last week's episode with Father Chris Alar. Um, I mean, there have been many moments where Our Lady has said in church-approved apparitions that there would be problems that would rise up within the church. I mean, in the key to Japan in 1973, she told Sister Agnes Sasagawa to pray very hard for the bishops and the Pope and that the demon would be implacable, which is a word that means relentless against consecrated souls. And we were told by Mary in these approved apparitions to pray very much for the clergy because of the, the threat against them with regards to, um, let's just call it weakening of our of our of our leadership and father you know you you brought this up many times that we have such a weak leadership in many areas not all but many and we see this because you know then so many priests who've been you know put on the outs and uh what happened to bishop strickland and some of these things that are causing so many questions and confusion out there right now and i'm not making any judgments on it but it, it is what it is it looks very very messy right now and it just seems interesting that at a time like this, when we have messages that have pointed to this sort of thing, we now get a statement from the very from that that department, let's just from that department that we've been warned would be potentially compromised. And that's a very nice way of putting it, if you if you know what I mean. So, but with that being said, Daniel, I just think that the timing of this, and then bring it back to what we started the podcast off with, you got a football player. Who who speaks publicly and it shakes the entire country and beyond. Mm. <laughs> Which should shouldn't it be a church doing that? Well, yeah, it, it takes be. it takes a football player. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Which so the timing of all of this just I mean China. Oh, takes and the world the hated him. What's that, Father? And the world hated him for it too. Yeah. 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 So it is very interesting the timing of all this, and I and I agree with what you're saying that it will cast out. Like the, I pray the rosary every day. You know, you know, and I do it not because it feels great, not because I mean, I, I appreciate doing it. Yes, but it's not because of an emotional high. I'm not getting that oh, type of moment. You know, I don't it, I. I do it largely <laughs> because she has asked for it. Right. You know, right. and when I wear the brown scapular, it's because of what she said to St. Simon Stock. Right. 1251 found to be worthy of supernatural, you know, origin and all. Yeah, there right. you go. And, and Father, you've enrolled thousands of people in the scapular in your priesthood, and it's always based on what? This event where Mary appeared to St. Simon Stock and said the words so powerful, those who die wearing this will not suffer the fires of hell. Of course, living a life that is you know what the, what the devotion means and, and the consecration means. But that being said, it can cast doubt on all of those things now. If, and that's the concern. Right? That's the concern. And I would say to the audience right now, We've got to be, as Father has said repeatedly on this podcast, we've got to be people who are really clinging to supernatural strength. And we've got, which means we've got to be going to adoration. We've got to be in prayer. We've got to be getting a confession and let the grace of God strengthen us so as not to give into some of these doubts and concerns. And I hope and pray that even a podcast like this 
let's stir things up in the way that hopefully will bring better clarification from the officials who put these things out. You know, if we are one small gear in the big realm, you know, I mean, you're on other podcasts and, and, you know, father will talk about this. I'll talk about this. And if we do it respectfully, but still let's challenge those who put these documents out and say, look, you got to make this clear because this is going to be, this is going to be seriously confusing to a lot of people. Right. Yeah. We're not, we're not at all asking for rebellion against the church. Of course not. No. Just think about how every apparition started. It started from uh, its recognition started from ordinary faithful Catholics realizing heaven was acting here. Mm. And we demanded piously, respectfully, but we demanded that the church acknowledge this. Yeah. And this document doesn't change that. The, 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 there's, the, you know, I, what I what I have spoken of recently is there's this phobia of a logical axiom. It's a, it's actually a philosophical axiom of, of it's, it's what the philosophers call a first principle of rational thought. It's the law of the excluded middle, meaning A or not A. Everything you even think of, including everything in the faith, proceeds from the logical first principles. And one of them is the law of the excluded middle, either A or not A. And in this application, either it is from heaven or it's not from heaven. And sure, we can be humble and acknowledge that sometimes we don't know. That's fine. But at the end of the day, that dichotomy, it remains black or white, yes or no. And people today, they don't want to say yes or no. They just want to listen to the devil who says, did God really say? And whenever you hear that voice whispering in your head, that's always an invitation for you to acknowledge simply and respect simply the self-will instead of the divine will. So you need to say, be gone, Satan, when you hear that, that serpent whispering in your head. God really did say. He really did say everything in public revelation. He really did say everything in the true magisterium and is not confusing where to find it. It's in your catechism. Yeah. And he really did say everything that Our Lady has truly announced from heaven in the authentic apparitions. Those are Our Lady speaking. Don't spend a second doubting that, even if there's no such thing as an approved apparition anymore. It's true. Our Lady speaks to us. Mm. She loves us. She's here with us. Well, I, I, I'm hopeful. I, we, we prayed for a, a supernatural revival. We got a kicker from a football team to, 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 <laughs> to, to stir things up. He, he, he was totally connected at the foot of the cross. Again, we're, we're here on the day we celebrate Mother Mary, Mother of the Church, and I love that image. And here's John the Beloved right behind me. And Mary, John the Beloved, Mary Magdalene, they're at the foot of the cross. And I've been touting about how we need to unite at the foot of the cross. That's the place that we need to unite. And I think somebody, people like Harrison Butker, remind us of that and, and help us and, and incentivize or get us excited about coming to that place. But what is that place? That's divine connection. Okay. That's the divine life. And remember, to to when I was kind of was doing that connect the dot thing with seven Salem's and seven of it, seven Nineveh's, two eclipses, seven years apart, and then a guy arises in his football jersey number is seven. Well, you know what? I'm going to start wearing seven. I'm going to start this summer. It's going to get warmer. I'm going to be putting a a t-shirt on when I go outside, and I'm going to make I'm going to have a t-shirt that has just the number seven on it. Because you know what it is? Seven of the Bible means like uh, perfection or completeness. That's the seventh day, okay? It all, but it also means it means spiritual power. It means divine connection uh, with God. And uh, I don't know. I, maybe God's going to show us more with seven, but but this is this has been a moment. We prayed for uh, that supernatural revival, and God is saying, pay attention to seven right now. And uh, I think there's a lot to that. So, anyways, that's what I'm. That's what I'm going to do. But mostly, I I think God has a great sense of humor, if you ask me. But, but uh, I, I'm just I, I'm I'm feel strongly about that day of rest, that day of worship, that seventh day. You know, spiritual perfection, spiritual completion, all that great stuff. And and here I, I feel we were led for that. But I think that's that's a that's how we got to end here, Dan. This has been. Fantastic. I want everybody to know too that um, you know, we're not bashing anybody, we're not bashing the Vatican, we're not doing anything, but you know, it, it just this isn't enough information. Just like with uh Fiducia Supicons, 
the Pulp came in with the 60 minutes interview, gave us the more information. And then we finally went, aha. Well, help us, help us to get that aha with this document, please. Because we have a lot of cons- uh, questions and concerns, especially this um, feeling like, uh, once again, that 100 years of Satan, we're, we're losing the, the belief in the supernatural power of God. So let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Doug. Thank you for having me. God bless you.